Hello, I'm Robin Garrell, the president of the Graduate Center of the City University of New York, and I'm delighted to welcome you to our new season of public programs. Over the next several months, with the expertise of scholars, policymakers, government officials, and artists, our programs will tackle some of the most challenging issues that we face today. At the top of the list is the question we ask tonight, economic recovery for whom? The Biden administration says, build back better. However, the recovery plan eventually takes shape, it must effectively address inequality, but how? Unprecedented times like these bring the opportunity to think differently, to reimagine what is possible and to forge new paths. Tonight, our panelists will focus on sound forward-thinking policies that we can put into place to rebuild the economy and on how to make those policies work, not just for the few or for those at the top, but for all Americans. The Stone Center on Socioeconomic Inequality here at the Graduate Center is the co-sponsor of tonight's program. The Stone Center is at the forefront of research on economic and wealth inequality. Its faculty, postdoctoral fellows, and graduate students are engaged in cutting edge research, analyzing income disparities across countries and regions, and the public policies and institutions that did either contribute to or could help lessen those disparities. Now it is my pleasure to welcome the director of the Stone Center, Professor of Political Science and Sociology, Janet Gornick, who will introduce this evening's distinguished panelists. Janet. Thank you, President Garrell. It is my pleasure to introduce this evening's panelists. I'll begin with our moderator for this evening, Carl Smith. Carl is a Bloomberg opinion columnist. He was formerly vice president for federal policy at the Tax Foundation and assistant professor of economics at the University of North Carolina. He's also co-founder of the economics blog, Modeled Behavior. Next, I'm happy to welcome Heidi Shearholz back to the Graduate Center. Heidi serves as senior economist and director of policy at the Economic Policy Institute. And earlier she served in the Obama administration as chief economist at the Department of Labor. We're also joined this evening by Ellen Zentner, chief US economist and a managing director at Morgan Stanley. Ellen joined Morgan Stanley in 2013 from Nomura Securities International. And prior to that, she held several positions, including senior economist at the Bank of Tokyo and senior economist at the Texas State Comptroller. Finally, I'm happy to introduce our colleague, Paul Krugman. Paul is Distinguished Professor of Economics at the Graduate Center and a core faculty member in the Stone Center. Paul is author of many scholarly books and articles for which he's received countless awards, including most notably the 2008 Nobel Memorial Prize in Economic Sciences. Paul is wi widely known, of course, for his biweekly column in the New York Times and some of you in the audience, I will assume, I imagine, are among his four and a half million Twitter followers. I'd also like to mention that tonight's event to some extent is doubling as a book launch celebration. Paul's most recent book published by Norton in 2020 is arguing with zombies, economics, politics, and the fight for a better future. A year ago, the Graduate Center planned a live event focused on the book. The event was scheduled for the week that New York City shut down and it was, of course, canceled. So we've regrouped, and tonight we join Paul in launching the paperback, which was officially published yesterday. So although this evening, Paul, you won't be arguing with zombies, we know that you'll treat the panelists and audience to some of the themes that you presented in the book. So now, Carl, I turn the evening over to you. Thank you, Janet. Um, our topic for tonight is, is recovery for whom? Um, I'll be posing questions to the panelists for about 45 minutes, and then around 8.15, there'll be an opportunity for you, the audience, to ask questions. But you can enter those questions uh, at any time, and then we'll pick them up uh, at 8.15. To start out with, though, I'd like to, to ask each of our panelists in about two minutes, if you can briefly describe what you think the most important developments we will see mm. or issues we should be concerned with are over the next six to nine months. And I guess we can start with uh, Heidi, if you um, want to go first. Sure, I'd be happy to. Am I off? I am off mute. Okay, mm -hmm. so it's a really good question. I think the um, 
Top priority is clearly controlling the virus. The virus is an enormous disrupt. I'm sorry for my trusted advisor here. If I try to lock her out, it will get worse. So I'm just gonna keep her here. Um, the virus is just a huge disruption to our economy. And until that's under control, we're gonna face ongoing elevated unemployment. So vaccine distribution and public health measures to control the virus in the meantime are key. And one part of those public health measures that I think sometimes gets left behind is putting in place an emergency temporary standard at OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration to protect workers from COVID. So the Department of Labor, which houses OSHA is currently working on this. And it will be a key part of not just keeping workers safe, but also controlling the virus because people who are working but not teleworking spend a lot of time at their workplaces. And if those workplaces aren't safe, they then become sources for spreading the virus. So controlling the virus, another key thing, I think we'll probably talk about this a lot tonight is relief and recovery. Over the next five or six months before the vaccine is widely distributed, we're going to have substantially elevated unemployment. So we need to make sure relief measures are in place, unemployment insurance, nutrition assistance, rental assistance, on and on. And we need to enact things like aid to state and local governments. So as we do recover, those state and local governments don't become big drags on the recovery by making cuts to make up for the revenues they lost during the crisis. And I think it's just super important to note that going big on relief and recovery is a racial justice issue because of things like occupational segregation, discrimination, other huge disparities related to structural racism. Black and Hispanic workers are more likely to have experienced job loss in this recession and they have less wealth to fall back on. So relief and recovery measures will help reduce the degree to which this crisis really exacerbates inequalities. All right, that's very good. So, uh, Ellen, can I move on to you and get your, get your thoughts here? Yeah, I think, you know, Heidi covered a lot of ground there. And certainly it sounds like an overwhelming laundry list if you're thinking about what gets done in just the six to nine months, right? But a lot can get done in one package, right? And Congress is contemplating uh, a, a package that we think will be on the order of one to one and a half trillion. Um, and that's just because as a as a markets-based economist, I've got to take my best guess at going line item by line on what we can actually get done. Um, it's very important, though, if I frame it this way, that any of those policies, and, and Heidi talked about a lot of them, um, that the aim of those is to keep people as attached to the labor market as possible uh, during this time. You don't want people to end up being out of work for so long that they leave the market, the labor market altogether because that ends up in structurally higher unemployment you're not bringing those people back so it, it's not only uh you know the aid to folks um that were already in poverty before this and already not attached to the labor market before this um and need that assistance but it's, all, it's also keeping what was a, a healthy labor market previously uh, getting it back to being healthy as quickly as possible and you're not going to be able to do that if you lose folks uh, all together. And a lot of those policies can be in this next uh, package. And Paul, let's... Uh... Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think we have a lot of disagreement here. What we have is, you know, it's up to the, it's up to the virus when we can actually start to get back to a normal economy. And uh, things are looking relatively good there. You know, vaccinations accelerating, the um, uh, worried about the variants, but it looks plausible that sometime in the second half of the year, we start to really cut back, but there's a huge chasm between now and then. And it's a, and the thing is, this is, it's not a normal recession in a lot of ways. And one of the ways is that it's been a, a much more unequalizing slump than normal. This e, slump, recessions are always hardest on the people of least to begin with, but this one has been incredibly disproportionately harsh on people who are low wage employed in service sectors that are not operating. So we really need a, a, a lot of money uh, to get through this. I think uh, I'm, I'm a little surprised that Ellen, I, I thought that we we're going to get quite close to the 1.9 trillion. So we'll see. Uh, you, you have a, a professional stake in getting this right. I'm, I'm guessing that it will get, I, I hope, I hope I'm right. But anyway, that'll be big, but it's going to be big. But the thing is then, then what? And we're, the big question really is going to be, okay, the economy probably comes roaring back once the virus has subsided and heads back towards where it was mostly pre-pandemic, 
But pre-pandemic wasn't that great. That was still an extremely poorly shared prosperity. So the question is, are, you know, uh, there's a bunch, it's a, just to say the, the, the American Rescue Plan um, is a remarkably redistributive plan. When all is said and done, it's, it's actually amazing how much bigger the benefits are for the worst off people compared with most policy measures that we've seen in recent generations. But the question is, is that a sustained benefit that keeps us, that gets us towards a better place afterwards? And that's still very much up in the air. So Heidi, actually, uh, one thing that interested me that you said was about uh, OSHA regulations. So this this deep into the um, pandemic, talk to me a little bit about like what what more could be done on that front. I mean, I mean, states have struggled with that already. And, you know, so. Yeah, no, it's so much more can be done. So OSHA has the authority to put in place what's known as an emergency temporary standard if there's a new threat to workers. The Trump administration never felt that COVID rose to the level of a new threat to workers that they would put it needed to put in place an emergency temporary standard. Biden, within his first couple of days in office, directed DOL to get working on this, and they're like well on their way to working on. I mean, they're they're deep in working on this, so I think we'll get one quickly. So that'll matter a lot. Another thing the that has been done that the Biden administration has done is um, made it so that workers can still get unemployment insurance if they are offered a job that's not safe for them. So the, the, one of the things that happened a lot over the course of this recession is people would be offered a job People, people who had, you know, lot, who were on unemployment insurance would be offered a job that was not safe for them, that exposed them to unnecessary risk to COVID. And then even though that was not suitable work for them, which is the standard to, to not have to take a job and still be able to get your benefits, many people were turned down. So there's, there's just lots of things that the administration is doing to help ensure that workplaces are safe for workers or they get the relief they need if they can't find a safe job. And do you think what the Biden administration has planned is sufficient on that? Or is there something, is there anything more you would add? I, I, mm, that's a good question. I don't know of what other authority that they have. So the emergency temporary standard is a key thing to do at the, in, in workplaces. And other panelists might know more about what 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 is what authority other authorities they have, and so there may be stuff that 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 still could be done after that. I just don't know what it is. Well, Heidi, one of the things that you said, and Paul brought this up, is that you don't think that we'll get the entire 1.9 trillion. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Is that because you think that some of it is? Um, is not as useful. Uh, that's been a, a charge that a lot of people have leveled that it's not it's not directly related to the pandemic. Um, or do you think that uh, it's a timing issue? Can you can you tell us? It was Alfie thoughts? Ellen was asking. I, so I, yeah. So I Ellen, think, that's what I said. Sorry, yeah, I, mean, I think this is why it's it's good to have a mix of folks from different backgrounds on the, on the panel because um, I have to take more of the approach to things of what we think will get done in a particular package. Now that's different than what we think could get done this year by a Biden administration. So when you think about, you know, what is of the pressing needs? So Paul talked about, you know, we're still in emergency mode. Uh, and so we need to get things done that will help us in emergency mode, which means things that can be done quickly, quickly with little resistance in Congress. Uh, which, which means uh, as stimulus checks to households that are directed toward uh, the lower income groups, you know, expanding and extending uh, federal unemployment benefits and things like that. The money to state and local governments that Heidi mentioned, that's very important. Um, when I go line item by line item, though, you have things in there like minimum wage. Minimum wage is absolutely a sound policy and something that the administration and the, uh, wants and the will toward that is increasing in Congress, but it's something that will probably come later this year in another reconciliation bill. And so I'm thinking about just from a, an immediate need stimulus package that we think could be passed in March. If I take out some of those light items that I think are gonna be saved for later, then it gets us down to a one to one and a half trillion dollar uh, amount. Um, but again, that's not to say that, that then they, they don't turn uh, to other options of what they can bring on board to make more sound, sustainable uh, uh, policy choices. Um, and so there's, there's much more to come from this administration. It's just what can they do 
right now. Now, here's here's the bizarre thing from my world of, of financial markets. The longer it takes them to pass this package, the risk that you have better data and the better data actually delays or puts off uh, the support uh, for this package. Um, and so you could run the risk. And so what I mean by that is, I believe we've turned the corner from the negative jobs, right? We had job loss that reappeared in the winter, uh, but we've started to add jobs again in a trickle, in a, in a trickle, but we started to add jobs again. We started to get people spending again because we're starting to open up some parts of the economy again. So it's just natural people are going to go out and mobility is going to increase. Um, but as you start to get better and better data, right? It takes that will away from Congress to act in an emergency way. Um, and so then you might put aside some of the pieces of this legislation and say, okay, well, let's just wrap it up and let's just move on to our big priorities and wrap it up in that. And then it takes longer longer to pass. So these are the kinds of strategy that we also have to think about in the world of finance on top of, uh, you know, the, the, the spirit of proposals and what should or shouldn't be done. Actually, can I weigh in for a second? Yeah, yeah, go for it. I, I, although I actually want Heidi's, because Heidi, at least in principle, is closer to Capitol Hill, although not physically these days. But um, the, um, uh, so my, my sense of this is that, first of all, um, a peculiar fact, I mean, and everything is political. You can't, you know, obviously these, these are all taking place in a political environment. And if you kind of make a list of proposals within the Biden, you know, package in, in terms of what is most essential and rank them from the most essential things to the, to the sort of least essential things. And then if you look at the polling and what's most popular within the package and what, it's still popular, but what is the most popular, they're kind of exactly reverse order, right? The, the, the $1,400 checks to the great majority of the population is probably the thing that economists are less, least convinced is essential, but that just totally tops the scales in terms of what people really want to see. And I think that's probably going to affect the package because the things that you might say, these are really maybe not so essential are also immensely popular and they're probably going to happen and maybe my, and I just take anybody who has a sense, maybe Carl, maybe anybody who has a better sense. My sense is that the Democrats have been, were so burned from what happened 11, yeah, 12 years ago when you know, they, the idea we can come back for another round, it never came, that they're likely to go for a, a kind of basically everything in the basket. Let's, let's ram it through exactly because what Ellen said, that, they, that uh, things may change, stuff may change, or you got to... Uh, you get Joe Manchin while he's still angry uh, yeah. over over January sixth, and and push this thing through. So I, I'm guessing that it's probably going to be much. I, I could be wrong, obviously. And Ellen has a financial, you know, her her institution has a financial reason to try and get this right. But I was guessing, I'd be surprised if it doesn't come in more than a, a one and a half trillion. Now my sense in Washington is similar to to what Paul has, but but Heidi, what what's your sense about this? I was just going to concur on this lesson that I think was learned in the aftermath of the Great Recession that if you that it that is important to go big early on because to sort of buy insurance against things actually turning out worse than we expected a you know a vaccine resistant strain coming out things actually being worse right now than we think we are like sort of the opposite of what Ellen mentioned as far as maybe the data are coming out better um, and so it does seem like there is, I, there, so I know there's competing pressures, but this, this idea that we are not, if we learn anything in the aftermath of the Great Recession is that we cannot count on having the political will to do more further down the road. Um, it, that will, to the extent that that lesson was learned, it will push the package now to be bigger than it otherwise would. And that's, that's a good thing. And Paul, in your ideal world, would 1.9 trillion be the number? Would you or would you have a, a much higher number? Do you have a sense for that? No, I. It, you know, the funny thing is, I think there's a fair bit of air in the proposal. There, there's a fair bit of stuff that is really not, you know, of not all that essential, or is 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 not well targeted. But as I'll explain in a second, that's that's okay. Um, the so you ask, why are we sending checks to lots of people who haven't lost their jobs and haven't really had an income hit? The answer is, well, some of that money will go to people who are falling through the cracks of the other programs. 
And so they really need it. And, but there's no really good way to target it. So we're throwing a lot of money at other people, but it's probably kind of harmless because it'll mostly be saved. It probably won't be inflationary. And it, we're in a weird world where everything is upside down. Normally you want the multipliers on government spending in a slump to be high. But in this case, actually, we can take some comfort in the fact that multipliers on a lot of it are pretty low. And uh, at the stuff that's not that essential also probably doesn't do very much macroeconomic doesn't have very much macro attraction. So I, I wouldn't go to the wall for 1.9 trillion, but I think it's really important to get every get everything that you want done, done. And so I'm okay with the number. And actually, I just want to say, so I come back to Heidi, the, the OSHA stuff. I, let me tell you my nightmare scenario for how things could go terribly, terribly wrong, which is that we get, we get sloppy. We say, oh, the vaccine is coming, but you know, we're impatient. We start to get careless. We start to relax the uh, uh, quarantine stuff and, um, and don't get it under control. And then the variants come along and turn out to be a lot more vaccine resistant. And, and where the OSHA type stuff comes in is saying, we really, really need to be doing everything we can to keep workplaces as safe as possible to avoid that scenario. And that's, so if, if your nightmare scenario, we've all, we're, we're all sounding really optimistic about the next, you know, about where we'll be by the end of the year, but there is a story where we completely blow it and we have a variant XYZ um, has exploded. The vaccines are not very effective against it. And we're in horrible shape by the end of the year. And we really, the policies really need to be adequate to do everything we can so that that doesn't happen. That's good. And Heidi, let, let me set this up for you. So I think that there, there are at least uh, three economic um, possibilities associated with the associated with the stimulus. So this is a, a theory that I've sort of laid out there is the, the checks and things that Paul, um, you know, doesn't think are very good or very targeted no, I think actually, you know, might have a positive effect if they help household balance sheets, if they get people in a position where when the economy comes back online, they're ready to spend um, in a strong way. And that could be a, a boost for the economy. Um, but then there's a, a, an alternative view. Um, I think Larry Summers has that, you know, the kind of scenario that I'm painting is actually quite dangerous um, because if all of this spending suddenly surges out into the economy, then um, we won't have enough workers, enough businesses to absorb it all. And it will turn into inflation and that could destabilize the economy. Um, in the financial world, uh, how are you guys weighing that risks? Or do you think that, as Paul said, we're, we're lucky the multiple suppliers are low and both I'm wrong and Larry's wrong and there's nothing to worry about here at all because it'll just be saved and not really affect the economy. Did you, can I ask a clarifying question? Did Ellen. you mean Heidi or Ellen? Ellen. Okay. Hi. Ellen, I, I'm sorry. I keep <laughs> making okay. that mistake. Ellen, 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 Ellen. It's Ellen. okay. All right. You're not used to having more than one woman on a panel. <laughs> of okay. a it, it is a, we're, yeah, we're, us, us males are, trying to consider our privilege and it is it is it is hard so anyway. ellen yeah i was because i was thinking of your your financial background so that's why yeah. i was trying so, to set that so up for Carl, you i think it's a i think it's a really um great question um so uh i am of the view um and we have done a lot of research around this at morgan stanley's of the view that we are going to have higher inflation um and i am of the view that that's not a bad thing um, and it's the Fed's view as well. So you've got Chair Powell uh, from the, the FOMC saying we'd welcome um, a bit of higher inflation. And so I do think that it's pretty obvious that when you've got an economy that can open up faster than the services sector and jobs can come back, that you're going to have those supply constraints creating inflationary pressures. And those are transitory, right? They're transitory because you add that supply, meaning labor coming back, uh, then you um, will alleviate um, some of those pressures. Um, I do think that we're going to be in a realm of inflation that's higher going forward than it was in the past. And we've warned um, our clients to not be complacent that what held back inflation uh, prior uh, in the prior 10 to 15 years is what's going to hold down inflation going forward. And part of that is fiscal policy activism. Things like minimum wage, an overall focus 
uh, with fiscal policy on raising the labor share of profits. These things will be inflationary and that's not a bad thing. Um, and it is something, as I disagree with, with Summers, that it's something that the government has not looked at or is just ignoring those risks. Um, and if you were to ask me, you know, whose basket do I want to put my eggs in? I'm going to put my eggs in the basket of Krugman, who's on this panel, and Treasury Secretary Yellen, and President Biden, and Fed Chair Powell, who all have a very strong, cohesive message that the risks to running a high pressure, from running a high pressure economy, um, uh, do not outweigh uh, the risks of, of doing nothing and having much longer term scarring. Uh, from COVID. Well, so I think, you know, my sense is everybody on this panel kind of agrees with that. But let me so let me be devil's advocate for that and say, OK, um, maybe a high pressure economy is good. But if you look um, deeper into sort of Biden's build back better plans, there are a lot of things about investing in infrastructure and investing in um, education. They're really major, you know, spending initiatives that he wants to put out there. And if the market gets scared by inflation, if people become, you know, complacent, feel like, well, there's enough has been done, you know, m might we be pulling out the rug from the sort of, uh, initiative to do those bigger things, to do those bigger investments in infrastructure or in uh, early childhood education. And I'll open that up to anybody who wants to, who wants to answer. Um, can I, I, I mean, I, I, I mean, I just argued this with Larry in a, in a different uh, thing and, and, you know, and it, it's not a, it's not a silly point. Uh, it's, it's something to worry about a bit. And my, my best answer there um, is that, if we are going to have more, more, more stimulus than we need, uh, which seems like a reasonable thing that's going to happen, um, that it will, but it, it will be a one-time event. That it will be that we'll be getting a, a burst of spending and possibly uh, a, a in, in some ways inflation is kind of the wrong word because it's more like we might have a, a blip in prices, but probably not a sustained increase in the inflation rate. Um, I believe it or not, I'm actually looking at the macroeconomics of World War I right now, which is kind of like that. There was a big rise in prices. It was, course, it was enormous. It was, you know, military spending was, went from nothing to 17% of GDP, but the, um, but the, the inflation rate did not rise on a sustained basis. And the point about the build back better, which is Biden needs for a Green New Deal, I think, uh, is, um, is that that wouldn't actually get underway until quite a ways. I mean, the, the point is, it's not shovel ready. It's stuff that would be, it's stuff that would be hitting peak spending in 2023, 2024, long after the, the, uh, the rescue plan is, is, is well in the rearview mirror. That's the best argument. Now, it, the psychological thing, and this is where you're right, Carl. If if people get spooked by a uh, you know by a year of four percent inflation, and say, oh, you know that's that's the end, then 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 it is a, a risk. But I, I, I there there are a lot of competing risks here. The question is is what how does it's more the political economy than the economics. The economics is really not a, so much an issue. But do people do people get put off by the fact that all the spending was inflationary or do they think, hey, this guy Biden, he brings prosperity. Let's trust him to bring more stuff. And uh, God place your bet there. And I'm, I'm, on, I'm on the open, open the wallets, but we'll see. I can add one quick thing, and it's just sort of yeah. adding to what Ellen and Paul just said, that I think a key thing is that the U.S. economy has run too cold for decades. This has like stunted growth. It's deprived millions of potential job opportunities and tens of millions of people of potential opportunities for faster pay raises. And so it does also come down to just the risks of doing too little are far greater than the risks of doing too much in the, in the sort of competing risks calculus here. Yeah, I think the views of the Fed can of course change um, any time. Um, but Chair Powell is, has, has laid down his claim um, pretty clearly that he is much less worried about uh, a high pressure economy creating uh, more wealth for the wealthy and more worried about not getting everyone fully employed again. Um, and that 
uh, their, their employment side of the mandate um, has now taken precedent over the inflation side. Um, and you know, the Fed has all the tools that it needs, including its communication, in order to control markets, financial markets that might get too uh, worried about, say, the Fed raising interest rates to control uh, rising inflation. You know, the Fed has the tools to continue to write, remind markets that this is the kind of increase in inflation we want, and we're not quite there on the employment side of the mandate yet. I mean, that is clearly taking precedent. I'm, I'm telling you, I've never seen anything like this out of monetary policy with the coordination and, and centralized view between monetary policymakers and fiscal policy that, that, um, that this is uh, something uh, that's about battling inequality. And it's not just coming from fiscal policy, it's coming from monetary policy and Chair Powell calling on the, the social responsibility uh, of the public overall for addressing this, this issue. It's almost like another mandate for the Fed, an inequality mandate that takes precedent over everything else. And that's with a focus on doing whatever it takes to get everyone as fully employed as possible. Yeah, so I, I've spent, I think, <clears throat> I've spent the last two years, I think maybe a third of my columns have been um, trying to convince Chairman Powell to take take on this high pressure uh, view or pro high pressure view. And so I'll explain for some people out there, the worry that we might have is that if there is a lot of stimulus and if the economy starts to grow soon, so by the end of this year, then the Federal Reserve who controls interest rates, Chairman Powell is head of the Federal Reserve, um, will raise interest rates in order to prevent too much growth in the economy, too much spending, which could lead to more inflation. So their worry would be that people are spending too much money and the economy can't absorb all that, it'll turn into inflation. They'd rise, in, they'd raise interest rates to slow that process down. But in doing so, in raising interest rates, they'd also slow down growth. And so you can't, you can't battle inflation without slowing down growth. And so there's a fear that they would act um, to slow down growth by raising interest rates if they saw too much inflation. Uh, but what Ellen's explaining is that, is that um, the Fed now has said that uh, not only growth, but um, an improvement in the, in the conditions for working people is one of its major mandates. And it's really going to hold its fire on raising interest rates. It's not going to be nearly as afraid of inflation as it used to be. And so um, that's, I think, is hopeful for us. Um, another potential hope, and I'll sort of turn to this, is that um, we've seen, you know, a huge change out of Congress. Um, over the last year. So the, the CARES package that came out was, you know, by far the largest relief package that, that, um, that that's ever come out. The relatively small package that we had uh, in the end of last year was larger than the stimulus that we had under Obama. Um, and we've seen, you know, significant bipartisan support for these packages. You know, has, has something changed in Washington where, you know, perhaps people are, are more open to government spending? Um, in particular, we've seen people being open to checks. As Paul said, that's, that's the most popular thing. Um, and so is this, is this a new moment, perhaps, for policy? And, you know, I'll throw this to Heidi, and I, and I do mean Heidi. So. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. I, um, I, I think if our 2009 selves could witness what's going on now, we would just be blown away. It does feel like an absolutely different world in terms of the fiscal response to this. That's fantastic. Like the, the, the Biden proposal for the 1.9 trillion, it's, and the CARES Act, that the packages that have happened, they have truly been at the scale of the crisis, which is just something that we haven't seen in, in, prior, in prior recessions. So it does feel like there's, there was a lot of organizing, a lot of work done over the, in the last 10 years to really elevate the importance of of macroeconomic policy to regular people. And I, and I think that we're really starting to see that pay off in how macroeconomic policymakers are, are, are thinking about their, their jobs. Can't help mentioning that when Obama was pushing his stimulus, uh, Max Baucus was chairman of the Senate Finance Committee, and now it's Bernie Sanders. <laughs> it's, it really is kind of a different world out there right now. And so, and one thing Paul is going to push through is that um, we've seen Republicans that have been in 
in favor yeah. of much larger spending now. Romney even came out in uh, in favor of a new sort of child allowance, which which would be a major part of the the next package that's coming through. Do you think um, on either cash assistance or child allowances that that we may be in a in a different world now than we were, you know, even two years ago? Uh, my guess is not. I mean, okay. I, I suspect that Heidi, again, is closer to this stuff than I am. But my guess is that even though Romney, I mean, it's, it, you do have this feeling that the, uh, that, uh, that doppelganger that they replaced the old Romney with for, uh, is, has been removed and we're back. It's, it's Romney, the governor of Massachusetts, has made a reappearance. But, but even so, I would be surprised if even Romney votes for the, 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 uh, the relief package. And I'd be very hard. I'll be very surprised if any, I, I think this is going to be 50 votes plus Kamala Harris, even, even so, but it's true that there, you are seeing a little bit. I mean, it, it uh, there, you're certainly seeing a little bit of softening on, on the policies. And, and if, if you look not at the politicians, but at the polling, what's extraordinary is how, you know, the, the rank and file Republicans, according to polls are, kind of, you know, what the Republican politicians would call socialists, in terms of what the, the programs they support. So maybe that starts to show. But yeah, I mean, it, it, what is definitely true is that the, the actually existing Democrats in Congress, perhaps emboldened by the fact that Republicans, I want to say that I don't think they're going to vote for any of this, but they're barely campaigning against it. People have been noticing there's almost no rhetoric about what a terrible thing it is that Democrats are about to spend this money. So, so I think there is a, there is a sense that it, it's okay to go big right now in a way that that was definitely not the case 12 years ago. Yeah, I think Carl, the real test is going to be, you know, there, we're in the no fault zone, right? We have been since COVID hit, and so there's there's less uh, less opportunity for blaming. Um, and holding back funds for bad behavior and bad actors. Um, you know, there's a human health component of this. And so it, it, it you know, I think, I think the, the jury will still be out if after we do the very COVID specific spending, you know, how much buy-in do we continue to get on broad sweeping changes, you know, policies that are going to increase um, the deficit and, and are more sustained policies though to battle inequality you know, um, we should be getting as much done right now as we can while we still got the cover of COVID to do it with sort of the, a feel good uh, moment, right? We hope that that feel good moment lasts, but we don't know if it, if it will, if this is just because we're in this special time of, of all this needed spending around COVID. And let, let me uh, let me remind the audience that we we have about six more minutes to go before questions. So so go ahead and get your questions in. But um, if you have anything, Ellen or, or the other panelists, what do you you know, what do you think the the most effective policy could be right now then for inequality to do something about inequality? I, I'm, I'm going to ask Heidi because I, yeah, I, I have yeah, something okay. that I just I just wrote about. It, so let's hear what Heidi has to say. OK, let's start with Heidi then. Well, I can jump in. I, I mean, there's a bunch of things that can be done. And but one thing that we haven't talked about is what kind of recovery do we think we're going to have? Is it going to be an, equi an, an equitable recovery or not? We know that the that the recovery from the Great Recession was really not an equitable recovery. We got, you know, we got down to historically low unemployment rates, but wage growth for low and middle income people was still surprisingly weak. We just didn't have the labor market institutions and standards that make sure that low and middle income people help share, are able to share in the recovery. So those are key things we need to put in place. We need to put in place the $15 minimum wage. We need to um, reform labor law so workers who want to be in unions are able to join a union. So those kinds of things, they're you know, definitely getting talked about. The $15 minimum wage is in the House bill that's, that's being talked about now. So it's, there's definitely more of a connection between, you know, if we're going to build back better, we want to make sure the jobs that come back are, are, are good jobs. So it, it's, there, I, I think people are Definitely, when, when we're trying to think of what do we want going forward, there's now an understanding that we need to put things in place to help ensure that the fruits of the recovery aren't just captured by the people who already have the most. Yeah, can I just say, I'm, I, we're not, one of the things that we really 
aren't talking about at all, but might be enormously significant is that um, the Biden administration has said that it's basically pro-union. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's a lot of discretion that just administrative discretion in how the NLRB does its job. And, and if, if this is actually going to turn into a significantly more organized labor friendly environment, that could have a, it's one of those things that is really hard to quantify. And, and it's really, I don't know if I've read any major newspaper stories about it, but it might be enormously significant. Okay, and we just have just, just a few minutes left. And so I wanna go back and um, we can start with Ellen. This doesn't have to be uh, necessarily on inequality, but if there are you know, one or two or three things that the audience should, should take away with them, um, what would that be? So I think that, um, you know, the, the important thing here is that fiscal policy can think outside of the box. And so we talk about, you know, minimum wage, which we've done before, we just haven't done it in a long time. Uh, 2007 to 2009 was the last phased in federal minimum wage. Um, you know, earned income tax credit. That is also a tax credit that's already out there that we've expanded over time. Uh, child tax credits, child care tax credits. You know, those are all policies that are already in place that can be expanded. That's 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 not real um, uh, out of the box um, thinking, though. Uh, you know, things that um, one create more opportunity for home ownership for lower income folks, where you can uh, create. Um, uh, where they can start to build wealth as well. You know, we've done a good deal of study around um, a racial disparity and access to home ownership. Uh, and so, uh, you know, policies that are directed toward trying to make things more fair and equitable will start to address um, in an out of the box uh, thinking way uh, to, to tackle these um, these issues. You know, we can talk about, you know, education would, could be a whole nother panel, whole other panel. Um, that's something that is, as, uh, from a political perspective, right, it's absolutely needed, but those are longer term policies. It's very difficult to get Congress members to focus on because they bear the fruits of that labor long after they're out of office. But uh, uh, I think if there's going to be some long-term scarring from COVID, we've got to really focus on how to catch people up for this lost year of education because it will probably weigh on their lifetime education or their educational attainments, which that alone, educational attainment alone can really tackle uh, the um, uh, income inequality um, as well. So I would just encourage uh, policymakers to think um, outside, of, outside of the box and uh, besides just expanding current policies that have already been tested. And Heidi, what do you think people should take away from this? You know, I'll bring up something and, it, and it's sort of an out of the box thing that's just a new thing we haven't talked about, but I think is, is related to lots of the things we've talked about and seems really important. And this is, um, I really wish that some of the key provisions of the stimulus that we're talking about were tied to actual economic conditions. They have arbitrary end dates right now. So I think right now, the, for example, the pandemic unemployment insurance provisions that are being debated, I, is, I, I might have this wrong at this point because things keep shifting, but I think right now, the things that are being debated will have them expiring in August. There's just, there's a ton of uncertainty about how the economy will unfold. It could be the optimistic scenario that I, you know, in my heart of hearts, I think that's what's going to happen, but it could go bad. We know very well we could get vaccine resistant strains of the virus that could set us way, way back. And so having arbitrary end dates to these kinds of provisions just makes no sense. It means we will have to expend enormous resources legislating all over again. And as we, already talked about. We have no reason to believe that the political will will be there the next time around to do what needs to be done. So I do ha have to say that I would feel a lot better about our prospects of truly avoiding a weak recovery if we would put in place relief and recovery measures that ramp down gradually over time as actual economic conditions improve. And Paul, what, what do you, what would you leave us with? Yeah, I mean, well, um, Definitely on what Heidi said. I mean, and one of the things that is a mystery is why we never do triggers. 
Right. And why, why not make more stuff automatic? And it's, uh, it, it's so obvious. I mean, if you ask the question, you know, really, uh, when, will, when will the economy be fully recovered? The correct answer is God knows. <laughs> Nobody has, and, it, and we should have policies that are designed to take that month certainty into account. But as long as I can remember, economists have been arguing for trigger-based policies and they never seem to happen. I don't know quite why. Um, but I would just say that the, there are a few things. There are some Trojan horses in the, um, in the relief bill, which I approve of. Uh, there are a couple of things in there that are intended not to go away with the pandemic. The child tax credit is, though it's not written as a permanent thing, everybody advocating it hopes and expects it to be permanent, which it should be. And that's a big inequality reducing thing. Uh, the enhanced subsidies for the ACA are intended to go on essentially forever. And again, that's something. So, so one of the things that we, it, one big task, assuming that everything goes well, is that we, is to make sure that we continue to do at least some of these things uh, on a sustained basis. I mean, I, of course, that's not, you know, both parties do that. The, uh, the, there are a lot of provisions in the Tax Cut and Jobs Act in 2017 that were legislatively supposed to expire, but there was absolutely no intention of having them actually expire, and, and two can play that game. So let's, let's just hope. And we, again, this is a remarkably equalizing policy that's being proposed and could make a pretty big difference in terms of, particularly at the bottom, the sheer amount of misery in America could be greatly reduced. All right. Well, I'm, I'm looking through the questions and I have um, a couple of questions on some, on UBI and a couple of questions on equalizing opportunity. And so then maybe, Paul, you talked a little bit about the um, uh, the effect of the child tax credit expanding um, funding for children. Uh, maybe um, Heidi and uh, Ellen, you could talk a little bit about um, that policy as well. I think it's one of the things that probably has the most interest out there. Um. Am I on first? I, well, let me just say, I mean, I've been a, you know, I always, I teach a class on welfare states and UBI always comes up. And my problem with UBI has been not that I have any objection in principle, but the arithmetic doesn't work. That anything that's an adequate income would be just too expensive, no matter how Keynesian you are, that we can't afford to have an adequate income guaranteed for everybody without conditions. Um, but, uh, the child tax credit really is UBI, but only for kids. And the thing is, kids are, there are not that many of them and it doesn't take that much money to make a big improvement in their lives. So, so we're getting a sort of, you know, a, a juvenile UBI is part of this and I'm game for that. Heidi, is that your view too? Uh, That's absolutely my, like that makes a ton of sense, at least as a place to start. Let's the child, the a universal child tax credit. It just, that it does seem like there's, that there's more space for that right now. And it's just absolutely the, the right, the right direction to go in. I mean, one of the, there's, there's a couple competing bills now from, you know, Biden has one, Romney has one. So there's a lot of action on this Romney's has some problems like it, it has higher um, it has higher monthly payments but then cuts a lot of other key safety net programs and so I, I but but I like the fact that it's pretty much universal so taking the best of all the proposals that are out there we could really have an important um, a, a very important really good policy for this country yeah I think I think it achieves um you know, a, a, a couple of, of desirable outcomes, right? Not just lifting more folks out of poverty focused on children, but anything that you focus uh, on children, uh, child care tax credit, child tax credit, um, EITC for families, which ultimately can pull the family out of poverty. You, you free up women to be more fully employed uh, in the labor market. Um, it's something that President Biden has called a national crisis. Um, clearly, when you look at it by gender, labor force participation rates of women have suffered much more than men during COVID uh, because of the added, uh, uh, the, the uh, overwhelming share of responsibility that falls on the shoulders of women to be the caretakers uh, of the children. Um, and again, it goes back to being sure that you get people back into the labor market fully employed as much as possible. Uh, in order to um, avoid the long-term scarring. 
Um, and so those types of policies really um, uh, achieve several different outcomes. All right, and um, I have a question here from Dan Rosner. Uh, explain the disconnect between the stock market and an all-time high and the underlying economy. How much danger to financial stability and the economy if it comes crashing down? Another 2007 or worse? And maybe Ellen, you're the you're the expert oh, to start there. Say, let me guess who you want to tackle that one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so you know the the stock market is a funny beast. Um, and it is often driven and mostly driven by fundamentals, but it's also driven by investor expectations. You have a tremendous amount of fiscal stimulus uh, behind the economy at a time when just structurally we are going to be adding more capacity as we open up services and people are moving about again and the weather is getting nicer and, uh, and earnings of companies that have been depressed um, are now that cash flow is going to be improving quite a bit. And so um, that's the power uh, of fiscal stimulus. Now, I'm not saying that doesn't mean that it's, there's not pure speculation on top of that as well. We can see that there's been plenty of speculation um, in the market. Um, in terms of financial, uh, and so let me put it this way, um, you know, going back to uh, Federal Reserve Chairman Powell and something he said, you know, do you want to, um, uh, uh, be, because you might not want um, the wealthy getting wealthier, do you squash the economy by raising interest rates, which can only damage the lower income groups as well by depressing the rate at which we bring jobs back? Uh, and so you don't necessarily, you're not focused on squashing investor appetite or risk appetite. Uh, and so what you're what you're focused on is getting everybody employed and you're willing to risk uh, overheating markets in order to do that. Now, financial stability is absolutely a concern of the Fed, but increasing valuations in the stock market is not that alone is not, a, 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 you know, something uh, that can be looked at as financial uh, a, a threat to financial stability. Um, what the Fed looks at is, look. All the regulatory changes since the financial crisis um, have better capitalized banks and the banking system to better withstand uh, bubbles bursting and shocks to the economy uh, so that they don't have to be worried about simply valuations rising in the stock market and continue to continue to focus at it, the priority at hand, which is uh, getting the economy back on its feet and getting people employed again. I have a question here from Joe Bizio. I'm going to, I'm going to paraphrase. Um, so it says, uh, but hasn't OSHA been totally defanged during years of Republican misrule? Um, this sounds like a pretty thin read for us to po uh, put our hopes on. Um, maybe Heidi, you could talk about that and then and we might move on to if there are other concerns about whether or not we actually have this sort of state capacity to handle certain challenges. That, no, that commenter makes a really good point. We have disinvested in our enforcement agencies, safety and health, other enforcement agencies like wage and hour, other things that protect workers and work, workplace conditions. We've disinvested in them dramatically. I wish I had numbers in front of me, but I don't. But if you look at the um, number of OSHA investigators per covered worker over time, it's just a steady decline. So um, we have a lot of ground to make up. It, we need to do strategic enforcement of, of key standards. We need to put in place standards to protect workers, in particular, uh, emergency temporary standard for infectious diseases that will protect workers against COVID. But we also need to just ramp up resources going to OSHA so that they can do more, more reasonable amounts of enforcement so that, the, that it really has so that employers know that they have a chance of getting investigated, which will then lead them to be more likely to comply with the standards that are there and will have fewer violations. And Paul, I don't know if you want to add maybe not necessarily on that, but the general question of diminished state capacity and what we might do. Yeah, I mean, we've had, uh, we've had 40 years of starving the beast, of, uh, of basically dismantling a lot of state capacity. Now, one of the peculiar things is that 
we can pay for a lot of rebuilding state capacity simply by rebuilding one particular piece of state capacity, which is the IRS. Right there, there's such a huge amount of, of legally obligated revenue that is not being collected because that agency has been starved, that that provides a lot of resources. But yeah, it's one of those things, I, even, even with a huge sea change in the politics, which I think has happened, you can't instantly conjure up an effective bureaucracy. Uh, it's going to take time. So, uh, but these are the things where if, you know, if Biden has a successful first year, then he gets a chance to do a lot more in the second year. And so it's one of those things where stuff can be built and um, it's anybody's guess. I, I think the big thing to say, I think this ties in with everything that Heidi's been saying and um, is that we now, I mean, our last democratic president fine man, did a lot of great stuff, at some level half bought into the Republican critique of big government. And miraculously, the last person you might have expected to be a, a kind of radical reformer appears to actually be much more of a radical reformer than Barack Obama was. And so I'm pretty hopeful. I think this is probably going to be our, our last one. Um... So this is this is a little bit more technical, and you know, uh, so uh, we have Geraldine McGarvey who wants us to comment on the fact that stimulus-based funds are based on pre-COVID nineteen incomes, uh, but most folks lost their jobs in twenty twenty. Um, is that appropriate? You know, how should we think about that? Uh, maybe. I'll start off with it. Yeah. And this is going to sound heartless, but oftentimes economists sound heartless because we look at everything in the aggregate. Um, certainly it's going to matter a lot to people that got paid a lot more in 2020 than 2019. Um, if you think about just in changes in wage, general aggregate wages, changes in general inflation, in the grand scheme of things, it's not a huge difference. In order to get those funds out to people as quickly as possible at a time when we severely needed it like yesterday, they've got to go with tax records on file in order to get those checks out quickly. And that's just when you're managing things in emergency mode, that's the easiest way for the IRS to do it. Anything other would have delayed those checks. Now the checks going through now are still based on that because it's the best information um, that they have. And what the IRS do, do, is doing is this tax filing season, you can actually, when you file your taxes, then apply for any stimulus that you might not have gotten that you were owed and get it, get it at that time. And I know that's, that's, small consolation to someone that really needed it. But I think in the grand scheme of things, um, I, I think the, the checks were appropriately sized and we got them out as quickly as possible. Did, Heidi, you might have a different view on that. I was just gonna quickly say the, um, the thing that that brings up for me is and looping back to this discussion of the child tax credit, this underscores the need to not have the phase out because you have people like, because if it's based on what your income was last year, you may have somebody that you know hit, made the you know hit the phase out level last year, but then this year saw a big hit to their income, and so they don't get the they, that they they won't get the subsidy, and then they may then start getting it just when their income is is rebounding, and so it this this problem I the the fact that this was a crisis and stuff had to get out fast does create real, like, I, I, I tend to agree with you, Ellen, I don't know how else we really could have done it. But it does mean we can use the same logic to do other sorts of policies that we know are, you know, happening every year, um, do them much smarter. I think what, what Heidi is saying here is that um, the checks that we should have sent out should have been universal. They should have been sent out to everyone. Instead, they were, they were sent out with an income threshold. And then anyone above that threshold got a little bit smaller check for each extra dollar they earned. And so we, in, you know, Wonks call that a phase out. And so if we didn't have that phase out, if we had more universal policies, uh, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't see this type of problem. Um, and that goes, I think, you know, to what Paul was saying about like a sea change in how we see things. Uh, phase outs were a part of, you know, the strategy of providing funds for people while still uh, keeping uh, a limited government. And so if, if there is a sea change, then moving to more universalist policies uh, might be a part of that. And th these are really wonderful questions, and I'm sure we have a lot more, um, but we've reached uh, 831. And so I think um, it's time for us to, to close down. Okay. Great. 
Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you. Good night. Thank you so much.